All right, we're recording now. Now, this is where we left off, right? We were talking about reading and writing to a file, and I was showing you, it's kind of clunky on CodeLab. If I was running this locally on my computer, when I say running locally, I mean like running Python on my computer as opposed to Google server somewhere. Um, it was kind of clunky to show you on CoLab, but the point is, when you're, whenever you're writing to a file, whenever we're done with a file, we should close it. But super, super, super important that we're doing it whenever we're writing to a file, because whenever you close the file, it does a lot of like tying off loose ends with the file, and it does a very important thing. It does that thing we were talking about, flushing the buffer, which was basically, when you're writing to a file, you're not actually writing to a file. You're writing to the, bu to the buffer, which periodically writes to the file. Because file I.O. input output is slow. So doing a lot of little writes is so slow. It's better to just wait until you have a lot of information and then do one big write. That's way faster. Close your files, yeah. CSVs, comma separated values. CSVs are an immensely popular file format. Every once in a while, people will butcher this format in a really weird way, but a CSV is a very common format that we use for, like, sure, it's textual data, it's text data, but it's like tabular in some way. And when I say tabular, I mean like it's kind of like representable as a table. We've got rows and columns. What we do is every piece of information we want to be in a column will be in a line, and it'll be separated by commas, comma separated values. And every row is, well, a new line. They're stored in plain text, but the values are separated by commas. This can raise an issue if the data you have is also filled with commas, but let's just not worry about that. These can be read as a simple text editor. So if I were to open up a CSV file, like this, if I open it up in a text file, a CSV file, I would see something like this. Name, height, weight, IQ. Subject 1, 170, 68, 100. Subject 2, 182, 80, whatever. I've just got data. You can see that the, like there's columns, even though they don't align perfectly. We effectively have columns and rows. It's like a table. In fact, it could look something like this. Sometimes CSV files have what we call like a header row, which would be like labeling the columns, like name, height, weight, IQ. Sometimes those aren't included. You just have to know, based on the file format, what's what. That's not uncommon. But a CSV would look something like this. If I open it up as a text file, I see this. But we can visualize it. We can think about it like this. In fact, what's really, what's really neat is with CSV files, let me show you. New. So first of all, remember, when something is a CSV file, let me open this, of course. There. There, there's my CSV file, right? It's not a .txt file, it's a CSV file. But those file extensions on computers, they don't really mean anything for the file. It's more of a, like a, a hint for the computer. And you'll notice that, in fact, when it sees a CSV file, if you have Excel on your computer, your computer actually wants to open this up as an Excel file. Now, it won't actually be an Excel file. It'll be a CSV file opened up in Excel. And the reason we like this is, well, like the data is like intrinsically tabular, so it's nice like that. It's great. Now, if you try to do all this fancy Excel stuff in it, it's not going to work. It's just a CSV file. And if you do all this fancy Excel stuff in it and you try to save it, it'll be like, I, you're going to have to save this as an Excel file. Like all those formulas and stuff. 
But you know, you could open it up even in Excel, which is great for like visualizing and looking at the data. It's, it's awesome. But at the end of the day, it really is just like a text file, but we separate the values by commas. Commas are rows, and rows are rows, or lines are rows, or whatever. Cool? Any questions about CSV? This is a very, very, very common format. If you have data that can be represented like in a table, which when you're working with data is very frequently, a CSV file is perfect. Every once in a while, you'll come across a CSV file that is separated by tabs. And then you might wonder, well, why are they calling it a CSV file? I don't know. That's a really good question, and they should feel really bad about themselves. Sometimes you'll come across some where they have arbitrary numbers of spacebar presses to separate them, which is even that much more of a nightmare, and it makes no sense. So a lot of people abuse this file format. Use commas. Commas, commas, commas. There is an exception where, so like we'll call this like tokenize, where basically like, well, what pieces of the information do I care about? Like think about on Caddis, whenever you do split. We're like parsing or tokenizing based on the default is a space. Now here, you wouldn't want to split on a space. You'd want to split on a comma. But imagine that you did have strings in your table where those strings could contain commas. So suddenly, like, you have like, a sentence that had a comma in it that really isn't supposed Like, If there's a comma, it's going to think those are two columns, even though really it should only be one. So there are exceptions where it's like, OK, we need to use semicolons because whatever. Fine, whatever. But yeah, CSVs, use a comma. They're fantastic. Use them. When you have a CSV file, like we did with assignment one, there are several ways you can load up CSV files into, into Python. In fact, there is a package, there's a library called CSV that has a lot of built-in stuff to read comma-separated values even easier. Now, to be clear, it's pretty straightforward to read a CSV file without the CSV library. But it does make it a little easier, especially if you're doing anything fancy. And if we go look at the code from assignment one, this is large star load Starbucks data. I import CSV. I open up the file. But you'll notice that I create this thing called like a CSV reader. And I give it a, uh, a Starbucks file. And then I've got my Starbucks locations. And then for row in Starbucks file reader, I just get the tuple, store it in the locations, and close the file and uh, return the list of tuples. There we go. Easy way to read a CSV file right here. So we, first part of assignment one, I think the second part of assignment one was read this function. Well, now we have a sense of what the hell it's actually doing. Now we know everything we need to know in order for this to make a little bit more sense. We're using this fancy csv.reader thing that makes it a little easier to read from a CSV file. Any questions about this? Yeah. Da -da. All right. The emphasized line in the, uh, with the for loop is the trick to reading data from a CSV. When using the for loop, we read one row at a time. So by the way, yeah, so like for row in Starbucks file reader. What's Starbucks file reader? Well, that was, that was this thing right here. That loop will read each like, line at a time. So this makes it really easy to iterate with a for loop over a CSV file. Yeah, 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 OK. We'll skip this for now. But this would be a good exercise. You could download the CSV file. No, it still does not. I don't believe so. But no, well, no, when you're looping, OK, it's complicated. And without getting into more detail, let's not worry too much. You know what? I, let's do this activity together. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm downloading this file right here. I'm going to put it on my desktop right here. 
and I'm going to go here, and I'm going to upload it. Yeah, 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 cool. You'll notice even when I load up the CSV file in Colab and I open it to just have a quick view of it, it even want to, it, like, it, it wants to display it as like a table, which is awesome. CSV file format is so common that like we commonly like to view them as tables. So this is like a built-in feature in Colab, which is awesome. So what am I supposed to do? Download this CSV file to your computer, then upload it to Colab. Write a function, load airports, that loads the CSV file into a list and return the list. All right, well, because I'm super lazy, load airports, because I'm super lazy, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do this basically. <laughs> I'm going to copy this, I'm going to paste it, I'm going to make it work. So I probably shouldn't call it Starbucks file, file name, file name, so what am I doing? I'm opening the file based on the string, this function will take a string, which is the name of the file. I'm going to open that file, and I'm going to give it to the CSV reader. I'm going to create a list called airports. Let's get rid of this comment, because comments are often wrong. For row in airport reader. I'm not going to store it as a tuple, though. What, do I, what am I going to do? Uh, what do I say to do? Return the list. Play around, get a little feel for the information, store the list. OK, so what I could do is I could turn it into a tuple. But interestingly enough, when we read, by the way, and the only reason, that, the only way you would know this is if either I tell you or two, you read the documentation, is when you iterate over, like the airport reader, it's going to give me like one line at a time. However, that row will already actually be a list parsed out by commas. Let me show you. Let me, uh, airports, not close. What is it? Oh, it's mad about the print. There we go. Bless you, bless you. Okay, so here we go. Load airports, and then what's the. When I hit run, <clears throat> each time through the loop, I print out. The whole row, like the row. And what is it stored as? Well, it's actually a list. What it does is it goes through each one line at a time. It's going to take that line and parse it automatically based on the commas and turn that into a list, which is great. It's kind of like just saying take the string dot split comma. It's like doing that, split on comma. But it did it for me automatically, which is great. So when I print out the row, I see, well, if we go back to the airport CSV, we see the code, the name, the code, the name, the code, the name, the code, the name, the code, the name. That's what we're seeing here. So it's a list of two elements. It's just a pair. And there we go. Great. Now, I don't want to just print that information out. No, I want to say airports.append row. And then here, now when I print it out, well, I see that we've got like a list of lists. 
Now, really, it's a reference to a list of reference to lists, but we'll just say it's a list of lists. Cool? Cool. Any questions? This should be reasonably clear at this point, but I realize it's the first time we're seeing this reader used this way. Yeah. Well, append is like it's adding it to the bottom of a list. So this list starts as an empty list. So if you have an empty list, first time through the loop, we take that empty list and we append the first row of information, which was a list. Next time through the loop, we append to that list. So we keep like adding to that list. If we were to print out the whole list every time, First time through the list, before I append anything, the list is empty. And then we go, then we append, and then we print it out again. And we see, well, the first row was appended. And then that same list had the next row appended. And so on, and so on, and so on. So it's growing every time through the list. Is that cleared up? Awesome. Cool. Any other questions about this? So now we won't, no, let's do it. Get name from airport code. Let's write another function. So I load it up. I've got a function that can load up that CSV file into like a list of lists. Now what I want to do is I want to write a function that, well, like, okay, give it an airport code, what's its name? So how do we do this? Well, at this stage, you should be pretty cleanly able to go like, it's a linear search. In this class, like nine times out of 10, when it's like, what type of function do we want to write? The answer is almost always like, linear search. <laughs> like, that's almost always what we're going to be doing. So how are we going to do that? OK, so for, I'm going to call it airport. In, I'm going to say for airport and airport list. Now, airport list, what does the, based on the way we loaded up the data and we stored it, each airport is actually a list, right? So each airport is represented as a list, where index 0 of that list is the airport code, and index 1 is the airport name. So if I'm checking for something, I'm saying if is equal to at index zero. So if the current airport's airport code, which is at index zero of the airport, if it matches the airport code I'm looking for, I found it. Except I want to return airport at index one. Airport at index 0 is the code. Airport at index 1 is the corresponding name. Is this clear? Raise your hand if you're like, yeah, yeah, I get it. OK, cool. Good, 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 good. And if we ever finish this, if we ever get to the end and we never found the airport code we're looking for, what should we do? Well, do I say? Negative one. It returns a string, actually. So maybe we return, I don't know, something like that. All right? There. So if I go down here and I say, equal, oops. So I'm going to load it up, and then I'm going to get
get name from code, airport code. What airport code should we look for? ABQ? YHZ. I know what that one is. Let's see if it's in here. And it's going to be in my, my airports. And then we'll print Look at that. Great. Cool. Give me another airport code. YQM. Uh oh. What's YQM? Moncton? Should add that one for next year. It could be fun. Any other airport codes? This is mostly American with a few Canadian airports. Come on, one more. Well, I don't think that is a, uh, no. YUL? Is that Montreal? Yeah. I think it only has like three Canadian ones in it. YYZ, who knows what that is? Come on. Toronto. You know that famous song YYZ too? Raise your hand if you know what I'm referring to. Oh my god. Are you for real? Are you for real? All right, I'm not going to explain it to you. <laughs> YCH? I can't remember. Like Calgary's in here, whatever Calgary's is. I, I have no idea what it is. Anyone know Calgary's code? YYC. Well, I guess I don't even have that one. <laughs> or, like, are you certain that's what it is? Yeah. It is? I guess I never added it. I don't know. Here, I think they're just tacked on at the end. So let's see what we actually have. Vancouver, Ottawa, Montreal. Oh, maybe, is there another Montreal airport? Yeah, OK, I guess I had the. It's the less popular. Oh, you were going for like the. The cool one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, I guess I didn't have that one. Anyways, there we go. There we go, cool. So look at that. We have a function to load up the data. Here, let's just, I guess we can go like this for white space. And now we have a function that can do a linear search. But if you remember, can you think of another data structure I could use to actually eliminate the whole need for the linear search? Dictionary. The dictionary, yeah, the dictionary. Where you could use, look, all the airport codes, they got to be unique. So make that the key to the dictionary and the associated value. And it's actually really easy to do that. We can change this out. Where this is now a dictionary, and now here we just say airports at row at 0 equals row at 1. So now, row, the airport still is written as a row, which is a list. But row at index 0 is the code, which is unique. And row at 1 is the name. So we are saying, OK, dictionary at row 0, the code, be equal to row 1, the string. And now. Hell, we don't even need this function anymore. We can get rid of that. And if I want to know, I just say uh, print my airports at y y y y z. Uh oh, what did I do wrong? Oh, did I not rerun this? There we go. Cool. Any questions about that? That's pretty cool. When you can, use a dictionary. They're better. Now, I might be leading you down the wrong path, though, because you might think, oh, I can use dictionaries all the time. Well, their use might not be as frequent as you might like, but when you can use them, use them. They're great. I, I seriously can't get over. Like, raise your hand if you know what YYZ is, the song. One person. Yeah, Rush. Did you look it up, though? I know Rush, but I have to look it up. Oh, man. It's 
such a famous song. Oh, all right. <laughs> this is kids these days. Holy moly. All right. Writing to a CSV file, that's pretty easy to do. You could create a string and add the commas wherever you want. That's easy to do. That should not be a difficult thing for you at this stage. But why reinvent the wheel? There's a library out there, CSV, that makes it really easy. So we can create a CSV file, call it specifically a CSV writer, and then when I, I can say something like write row, and if I give it a list, it'll part, like it'll turn it into, well, like, okay, turn it into a string separated by commas. So this makes it so easy to write a list straight to a file. Like a straight, straight is like a row with separated by commas. In fact, I'm pretty sure you can take a whole list of lists Let's test it. No. Let's make it a smaller number. One, two, three. There. I've got a list of lists. I know it's a reference to a list with references to lists, but they're lists of lists. And now let's make a, uh, okay. Uh, see if I can figure out how to do this real quick. Writer. Open. I'm just going to nest it in here. I don't usually like doing this, but I'm going to nest it in one line. Uh, mm, right row. Maybe I can only do like right. Will it only let me do right rows? I'm curious. Mm, probably because it never, okay, here's what I got to do. What did I not do? So you notice it's kind of interesting that I have to make a file and then wrap the file in something. Why? Because. There we go. And look, it, it did it. I could just give it a whole list of lists. I called the right rows, and it's like, all right, I just write them all. It's pretty handy. Pretty great way to easily dump data in your file. If, you, if, you're, if your code has a bunch of data that you need to like save for later. Because remember, every time you close your program, all the data is gone. So if you want to save it, well, you can save it really easily with a CSV writer. You don't have to use a CSV writer. You can save it as text, whatever. But this makes it a hell of a lot easier. Any other questions about this whole file I.O. stuff before I go and carry on? I want to be clear. The level in which I want you to understand this for this course is basically like if on, a, if on an assignment I were to say, hey, go implement this, you know enough now that you can go figure out how to implement it. I would expect you to be able to go like figure it out, OK? Which you will have to do a little bit for assignment four. But I'm not going to start asking you trivia about file readers on like the test type thing. So your exposure to this is important to give you context of what you can do so you know enough that when you need to do it, you can go figure it out. It's so you can't say like, well, I don't know what I don't know. Well, now you do know what you don't know. So you can go figure it out. You can identify it. That's the point of this topic. Last chance for questions about this? All right, next we get to a topic that's a little weird to new programmers, but it makes perfect sense. 
But it doesn't make a lot of, like, I feel as if this doesn't make a lot of sense until you really, under, like, until you get a chance to really see why. So I'm going to do my best in this topic to give you that motivation. But I fully acknowledge that the motivation I'm going to give you might not be sufficient for you to, like, truly grasp it. And, like, I know that. But I'm giving you enough information that it gives a little bit of the insight into some of like the mystery that you've been seeing whenever you have like an exception or an error. And why it's important. And we're gonna learn a lot more about this like next semester, but right now the point is you're getting some of the stuff demystified in a, in a positive way. You've seen Various exceptions. Now, Python calls them errors, and there's kind of some nuance in what that means, but we're not going to worry about that. I'm using the word exception. We've seen exceptions before. You've seen something that looks like this, right? If I try to turn the, the string hello into an int, I'm going to see value error, invalid literal for int with base 10, hello, right? We'd see something like that. And there's a message there, and that message gives you some information. What is it saying? Well, it's saying, that's not something in base 10 I can convert to an integer. Like, that message tells you something. But with an exception, all that really, really, really matters for, as far as the computer is concerned is that you have something called a value error. That message is just information for the human, just some details about what went wrong. But this produces a value error. Now. Exceptions are not necessarily, maybe that's not even the right word here. Exceptions are not errors. Exceptions aren't mistakes. An exception means something peculiar happened. And that may have been caused by a mistake, but something exceptional happened. Now, I'm not using the word exceptional as a positive, it's just something that's like out of the ordinary. Something strange happened here. I was expecting to get something I can, con this code was expecting when you, the int function there, call it a function, was expecting to get something it can convert into an integer. It got something and it goes, uh, I can't do that. It didn't, like, so like something funny happened here. Now, interestingly enough, if I run this, like, oh, well, this would crash the program, right? Well, kind of. Doing this isn't what crashed the program. It's the fact that this raised an exception that was never dealt with is that what crashed the program. But more on this in a moment. Yeah, so when we try to convert the string hello to an integer, Python raised an exception. We've seen other exceptions, like index errors. Here's a list, A, E, I, O, U, and give me the thing at index 11. Well, list index out of range. What did I do? Well, I tried to do something that Python can't do. Like, I can't go to index 11, there's no such thing. Uh, both value error and index errors are exceptions, but there are many more kinds of exceptions out there. We'll see more ourselves, and we can make our own type and everything. But, like, consider how the print function, someone had to write that code, right? You, the, the print function, we can call it print. Print hello world and it prints hello world. Someone had to write that, though. Okay? You didn't write it. You can use it. Just like the absolute value function, you can use it. You didn't have to write it. Some functions we had to write, like load the airports. Well, we wrote that function together, and then we can call it. But some people, like there's a print function that was built into the language, but somebody had to write that code. Uh, yeah, OK. Someone had to write the code for converting strings to integers and indexing elements from a list. OK. Yeah. So. Like with print, someone had to write the code, well, how do I convert a string to an integer? How do I actually access the elements from these lists? Somebody wrote that code. If I'm writing the code for converting strings to integers, but listen very carefully, because this is a very important like concept. If I'm writing the code to convert strings to integers, 
What should I do? Remember, I wrote this code 30 years ago, right? So I'm, let's go back in time 30 years ago, and I'm writing the code. And I say, huh, what should I do? What should my code do if someone gives me a string that can't be converted to an integer? What should I do? I don't know. I really don't know. Should I say, like, try again? Should I just return a special value? Should I, uh, like, ask the user for input? Should I crash the program? Should I just ignore it and carry on? What do I do? Well, I don't know. There's a lot of options. I don't know what to do. Because the way you're using my code in the future, I have no way of knowing what works for your situation. I have no way to know that, obviously. So all I can do is say, hold up, something funny happened, something exceptional happened, and pass that information back to you, the person using my code in the future. Like, I'm like giving you back a value. It's like I'm returning a value, but it's a special situation where it's like, ah, something funny happened. What are you going to do about it? I don't know what you want to do about it. So that's the idea. And we'll wrap up here. We'll carry on tomorrow.